A very good evening to all our viewers. Aja and Idak, with immense pleasure, would like to present yet another spectacular episode of Master Speaks. Decoding Architect Ratan J. Bartley Boy in conversation with Architect Parish Kapse. Today's webinar is presented by Everest Industries. I hope this session is inspirational and equally motivational like all our previous webisodes. Before we start the session, we would like to present a short AD and thereafter, Parish sir will be taking the lead. Thank you. We always start with a blank piece of paper. The idea usually comes as a sudden spurt and once that clicks, uh, I think we're all very excited. It should give you goose flesh. I think for me architecture is really a discovery. We are actually dealing with elements such as the wind, sunlight, rain, shadow and creating spaces which you've only imagined, which you've actually never created before. Architecture is made up of materials. So the choice of materials is obviously extremely important. I think our discovery, so to say, of the fiber cement board, which could be used, uh, was very fascinating. The board itself allowed us to create a palette uh, where we had this gray, clay-like surrounding and then we had little jewels of art juxtapositioned against this, this very grey background. I feel using prefab boards in a mechanical clamping way adds uh, to some kind of an insulation if it is used as a second skin on a building and that also adds to save your air conditioning cost. Also they are aesthetically very very beautiful especially the modes which have come now with textures of wood stone and other finishes. When you're using prefabricated boards and you're using so many of the prefabricated walls, then specifically we talk about efficiency in terms of the fact that it's locally made and definitely something which is locally made is far more efficient. The fact that a material which can be bought and come to site in literally three days can be cut and be used and be put up so quickly is something which is going to save you time. Cost-wise, it's extremely efficient. So definitely using these materials plays a part in creating a sustainable structure. We are doing one APMC market in Latu. Uh, there the whole concept is that we are putting all the prefab structures all together as a semi-lax cafe to develop it. So it's supposed to be complete in four months' time. So we did uh, DA in one of our projects, which we did the whole factory of 200,000 square feet was completed in two and three months' time, and uh, including the press and everything uh, put together. So there are so much of advantages of using the new things. We designed a building uh, in Delhi where we proposed a hollow column, hollow beam system. Uh, then using these uh, paneling systems to cover the whole. Um, structural and service framework. So even the flooring would be just stones on neoprene pads. So you can actually dismantle the whole building after it's used and have as little, you know, ecological footprint in the area. So I think a prefab uh, methodology allows you to achieve that very easily. We were using this particular thing. We were able to reduce 30 mm sizes to uh, 19 mm sizes. We were able to reduce the structural costings of the facade. And I think that's very important in architecture that we, we constantly question our work and we constantly evolve it. Thank you very much, Everest. Indeed, a smart AV to bring in the concept of reimagine with new materials, indeed a need of the hour. On behalf of the entire managing committee of AJA, architect Hiten Sethi, Bobby Vijaykar, Vivek Bhole, Arun Gangude, Sopnil Savant, Trupti Puranik, 
and Apeksha Kore, I would like to thank you for your wonderful support and overwhelming response on each and every program presented by some of our finest architectural professionals in our knowledge series. Today, we have the opportunity to decode one of India's best multi-talented personalities and a master of 40s. Decode, define, detail, and design. Mr. Ratan Jamshedji Bartley Boy. Other than being a heartthrob of many, Ratan has also been an avid traveler, a sports person, and most importantly, he's been a people's person, which is one of the most important virtue of being a successful individual. Whilst I had a, some wonderful time chatting with Ratan before the session, I was really impressed with the approach towards a task and art of detailing which Ratan inculcates within, which undoubtedly places him as one of the best jewel in our crown. Ratan, it's such a pleasure to have you in this session today. Thanks, Parish. Thank you, everyone. It's great to have uh, to be with you all. And I'm hoping to get something out of this session myself. Looking forward. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Ratan. Thank you. Thank you. But then we have grown up seeing you conceiving some of the, the best and magnificent works since you passed out way back in the 1980s from Sir J.J. College of Architecture. I'm sure in your initial days, you must have been the coolest person uh, at college. Uh, we are all dying here to know what were your first few years in college? What, what kind of a heartthrob were you? And I'm also actually very pretty excited to know that you were actually allowed to do a thesis in a duo. Uh, we definitely want to hear and learn more about this. Looking forward to hear from you. Okay, thank you, Parish. Uh, well, I don't know about the heartthrob. There were <laughs> basically three girls in our class in those days. But, uh, well, I was, I was in St. Xavier's College doing my science degree and I was thrown out of St. Xavier's because of some student council issues over there. And uh, my present wife, my girlfriend at that time, was already studying in Xavier's. So I thought the first, the first thing that I should do is be very close to where she was. And I moved to JJ College of Architecture and that's how I got into architecture. But having said that, I'm going to go one-on-one -on -one, uh, and run you through a few slides of my own days and answer your questions progressively on that. So primarily, this is the class of 1980. All those people with long hair there are actually the guys and the girls you can't even see in there. Okay. I am sitting in the center there. Uh, yeah. Raja Poredi was our principal and we had a great time in JJ. Uh, I was doing photography, I was doing uh, fashion shows, I was yachting, I was doing work with my dad, I was working, traveling along, and uh, where was the time for college really? But having said that, I think at the end of the day, uh, in our last year, a friend of mine and myself just decided that we should get serious, take full advantage of our years in college and do focused, concentrated work and make good on our education. So really our college days was all about, you know, who we were and campfires and, you know, picnics and stuff like that. And I'm going to talk to you about our thesis work. I've been able to pull out a few slides, maybe four or five of them. I did a project which was about high rise, high density and high income housing. Everybody else was talking about low rise, low density or, or your low income groups, etc. But I was really stunned by what had happened at Cuff Parade because that was the newest development that had happened in those days, the early 70s. And I was really comparing the social issues and the living issues, living conditions with the new densities that were established between Cuff Parade as a new sort of uh, city center and the Kushru Bagh and the Ras Rustam Bagh, the other Parsi Baghs that were happening. So really we took on a mathematical model. We looked at chokes, we looked at, you know, spaces that were used. We looked at 25 storied buildings. We looked at ground plus three buildings. 
We looked at unintended usage of spaces, interbuilding spaces. We looked at how people were not given the provisions for servants areas or children's playgrounds. In fact, the kids in Kaf Parade, I would go to say, never had feet or the earth under them because they were always on concrete in their car parks, playing around their buildings within their compounds. Where we saw 18% which was built up in the density areas of Kaf Parade, we saw 35% built up in Kushrubag and Rustambad. But we had huge open spaces, we had huge consolidated open spaces which people could use and enjoy. I think if you looked at the image on our left, that's a shot of Kaf Parade, no Google, no drones in those days. It was wow. a, it's a physical okay. photograph. Okay. And what we did was a skyline situation that we drew on our right hand side photograph to yeah. show that you could accommodate exactly the same density but without yeah. plotting the buildings and keep yeah. it as low as maybe five plus ground plus five, ground plus seven. So this is pretty much our thesis. Of course, being an architectural situation, we couldn't get away with just mathematics and photographs. So we had to physically do drawings and then show this. Rathman, so my what do you hear? Oh, sorry. sorry, but then is this a hand-drawn drawing? Yeah, this is a hand-drawn drawing. My partner and myself must have slaved over several of our drawings and several wow. of our that we presented. This is That's actually nice. drawn. This is actually drawn pen and ink for, uh, with with rotary pens and hatching machines and stuff like that. Excellent. So this is really this is really what we were all about in college, and we had the yeah. most fabulous time. We probably walked out of college being number one and number two at the university level, and our names are up in the lights on the in JJ. They still see that. So crafted so very meticulously to this level of detail, Ratan, uh, I'm sure this would have helped you in the many years to come. Tell us how did this uh, detailing Kida or this uh, background help you to kindle the housing designs in your uh, real time professional practice? Uh, you've done an array of housing projects. We would like to hear more about uh, them, please. Said that, the, I think the most important issue is really how do we solve this problem? Where you have the informal, where you have the natural, and you have you know the formal housing for the salons, etc., etc. So really, my whole focus after so many years of practice in housing is really focusing on the people that are going to be living in these kind of places, and we've established a new sort of avatar or a new mantra where we're looking at aping the Maslow's triangle, where we're looking at the basic bottom line being housing standards for affordable housing, moving up to optimization, where you look at safety and security for people where they stay, where we look at the quality of life. These are really the physiological needs. And then you move up to the aspirational qualities where people are looking at their identity and their belongingness, their friends, their communities, etc neighborhood standards, they look at the achievement of having a home of your own or renting a large space of your own and then eventually establishing the full potential as you speak or as you stay in your home. That's really the urban design, that's really the ambition of the public at large. So in principle, this is really where my housing uh, philosophy is taking me now and probably in the next few years, I'll be probably focusing on these issues. Ratan, that was pretty innovative and at the same time, uh, very aggressively detailed uh, projects. Uh, we've seen all these details and the way you've carried them. Uh, we would like to learn as to how these five years or the five and a half years of your uh, school at, at Architecture College helped you to shape up the next stages of your life. So, Parish really. Uh, five years, or five and a half years impacting 40 years. That's a big one. Yeah. Yeah. In principle, what we've looked at is everything that we really imbibed or absorbed at JJ is coming in handy and has come in handy right through our entire, uh, uh, entire professional practice. I think JJ shaped me as a person and me shaped myself as a professional. And then progressively, JJ always continued to work as influencing us as professionals into our practice. And if I look at the last 40 years, I'm going to be 
probably broadly bracketing them like this decade earlier. So if we look at the 80s, it was about in multidisciplinary practice that we did. If you looked at the 90s, it's probably experimentation, a huge amount of experimentation. If you looked at the early 2000s, it was about templatization. Don't forget that in the 90s, you had this whole thing about India becoming a, a freer country, imports, exports, stuff like that was happening. Yeah. And, and everything was sort of coming into our laps. Yes. Earlier in the good old days, we had to design everything that we wanted to design. But here, suddenly, we were looking at this whole thing in terms of the licensing stuff. Yeah. Uh, templatization really was about moving fast, growing hard, you know, moving from office to office, space to space. I think in the 2010s, we talked about digitization only because of global Googleization. Anything you wanted was a click away. And at this time, by which time we had already done substantial amount of our urban design work, we were into looking at urban design focus. I think we spent a huge amount of this decade, this last decade, looking at all sorts of initiatives for the city, for the country, etc., etc. And of course, we've come into today, which is really COVIDization or, you know, <laughs> where we have to, <laughs> nobody yeah. knows where we're going to go from here. And yeah. we need to figure out how we're going to repurpose ourselves. So the way I would look at myself is really 40 years of realities and relevance, okay? trying to be relevant and remain relevant for whatever is happening in our time and day. Perfect. So of course, through the 80s, my kids were born. That's me carrying Rehan around. Wow. Uh, the kids travel with me to every construction site. You know, we, we took them, we, they play around We everybody asked them, what does your dad do? And they say, he's a carpenter. <laughs> Uh, when I had time at home, you know, I used to work at home a lot, also in addition to the office, etc. I'd spend my time with the kids. Uh, I'd travel a lot, I'd go all over the place. I was working with Astad Debu, the dancer, as his technical director, and I'd travel all around the world with him. Ratan, wait, stadium. Ratan, wait, that's, please, sorry. Yeah, yeah, Is uh, that you in that short? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's me. I had to buy bread for breakfast in Paris. Yeah. Wow, that's just wonderful. Yeah. And my so white shirts, my yeah, white shirts have always been around since then. Even in shorts, you're in white shirts. Absolutely. That's I cool. tried wearing a suit in the good old days when we were working with these people in Paris and all around the world, but it didn't work at all for me. Yeah. I stick to my cargoes and my white shirts. Yeah. And then, of course, we had a lot of picnics and a lot of celebrations and we enjoyed ourselves thoroughly while doing all this. Yeah. The picture that you show, that you see kneeling down, me kneeling down with my hands crossed, is yeah. really talking to my accounts department. <laughs> <laughs> so, so having said that, that's really the past 40 years of our lives. So these guys, are, I, I was told that these guys are still working with you. And uh, that's very noble of you as well, to have such a long uh, staying staff. That's nice. Yep, it's about loyalty, it's about people that stay together. And, and build an organization, an institution that is the RGBS sort of label. Some the new new management guys come in and say that they're bloody dead. Would cut them off, move ahead, but that's not happening. I mean, they, these people have been with me ever since. Yeah, that's nice. Brother, we've known you as a man of uh, city and infrastructure development, and that's what we've seen you all over Mumbai, uh, having shaped some of the most unique developments. We are excited to hear about your integrated approach to the city uh, with the various projects, especially the Bombay Central uh, Railway Terminus. And uh, I must correct myself here. Uh, did I hear this correct that you've done 70 railway stations? Well, the number is actually 76 now, but who's <laughs> counting in any case? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it's a wide portfolio of uh, constructed, executed railway stations, starting in 1988 when we started the new Bombay stations and going all the way up to last year when we finished the monorail stations for Bombay. Yeah, okay. it's, it's been a long and checkered infrastructure career, yes. So, like I said, starting from Zuinaga, Nehrul, Sanpara, etc., etc., We've been working with standards of the railways, you know, the standards that were written in the early 1900s. We sort of tried to change them in the late 80s. 
Shirish Patel, the construction, the, the structural engineers, and us worked on these stations. Shirish had got a, a call from the railway station people saying, would he be interested in doing railway stations? He gave me a call and he said, yeah, sure, why not? It'll wow. be great. I was probably 30 years old or 31 years old at the time. Yeah. And we started fighting about changing the standards. We started changing the widths of passages, of subways, of bridges. <laughs> Uh, they told us that, you know, the other is the ultimate and it works brilliantly. Who the hell are you going to do? Who the hell are you to change the standards of railways? But we yeah. pushed and we fought hard and we got seven meter subways and seven meter bridges, etc, etc. Yeah. We worked with brand new materials for railway stations. This is Ravale. Uh, Shirish and his team worked brilliantly and incessantly about trying to look at economies of scale looked at cross columns as x columns like you see in this photograph to reduce the cost of the project to increase or, or reduce the spans etc uh, we've done a lot of work for the harbor line going to the western line and the additions to the stations there these are picturizations of that uh, we've also worked on large station complexes this is one of surat for example and you talked about our metro lines as well. We've done the Dwarka line. We've done about 15, 20 stations in, oh, amazing. in Delhi and some incredible stuff because this was about saving a crore or two on each station building in terms of cost. Of course, yeah. our fees got cut because of that. But that's a separate <laughs> issue. But we were able to economize and look at economies of scales and structural engineering. And this was quite fascinating at the time for us. Yeah. Then we of course moved on to Nagpur Metro where we tried to win a competition. We won the competition but we unfortunately didn't get to execute the jobs. These were multi-tiered railway stations. These were multi-tiered metro lines going north-south and east-west on top of a highway that already existed. So quite complex in terms of its physicality. Uh, commercial spaces that are built on top. This is what we started in the late 80s in New Bombay and we continue to push that as a concept. That was quite fascinating. Uh, Kharagar was an exciting station and I'm going to talk to you for a couple of minutes on Kharagar. Yeah. Kharagar was what I was pushing since the early 90s and finally we got a chance to do something like that in 1995. Yeah. Kharagar was about using the airspace for parking. And we talked about doing a parking deck of about 650 to 750 cars and two wheelers. And I wanted to do a multi-tiered multi car parking deck because we said that when the traffic increases and people come to work and come to the station from their homes, they can park their cars here, ride on the train, come back, pick their cars and go back into Kharga to stay. Of course, nobody allowed us to do more than one deck. But we were able to do one deck. We were able to save large parcels of land. We were able to, or supposed to sell off those parcels of land, recover the entire cost of the project in terms of the capital cost. And the operational costs is given by virtue of the car parking uh, numbers, as in the, the charges that you get from the car parking on a daily basis. Yeah. So I think this was an extremely interesting sort of proposition. Because there's not too much design to do on the railway stations, we had fun. We sort of looked at frustrum columns and we different heights of springing heights of the cones that we had. So when your train moved in and out of the station, you got this beautiful wave pattern that's sort of kinetic graphics. Uh, we looked at light and shadow and fins and concrete. It was quite quite a great time that we had doing cargo. Also, if we were coming in cars, the lowest priority is for chauffeur driven or car, car traffic. And having said this, now our people coming in cars to the station would just park on top and yeah. drop down six to eight meters directly onto their platforms. So these were all the advantages that we had for Cargo. Bombay Central, you talked about, I've been pushing this project as a multi-tiered project for the past, probably since 2004. And we've been pushing this huge complex, saying that project of, of in the center of Bombay as a railway station come integrated transportation project could be quite phenomenal. If you see the heritage building that's down there in our frame, you can see that it's the old heritage building. And yeah. we built in and around the park, we built in and around 20 acres of this entire land that belongs to the railways. 
what we've done also is released the bus terminals what we've released is the st terminals what we've released is land of 8 acres 12 acres 10 acres all around the area which could be done, now used as gardens for these people to work and and, and play in and all these facilities could actually stack up as a multi terminal product for bombay central of course we have proposed some huge high rise buildings that would pay for this entire development something like 2000 odd crores but nothing really happened out of that and i'm still pushing probably five railway ministers probably five railway boards but we're still pushing and very <laughs> very very bullish that this will actually happen so this is really integrating all sorts of transportation the metro is here the monorail is very close by suburban is here local transportation is here bus traffic cat taxi parking everything can actually happen on uh, on mumbai central so this is really picturization to try and sell this to the people who want to see pretty pictures right we also work on integrated mobility plans and we've done three of these large interchanges one at malakshmi one at parel and one at dadar trying to figure out how we could get everything monorail metro rail etc etc coming in and giving public accessibility to multimodal transport so these are these are the initiatives that we've been taking in our urban design one of the other initiatives we've taken is what we call best practices really looking at thinking about strategizing how the bst assets that's yeah. about 260 odd acres of bombay central bombay wow. can be used very effectively to make money for the bst as well as huge huge advantages for the areas in and around them for at least half a kilometer radius so really we talked about how we can stack all the facilities in that real in the compound if there was a larger compound we could do the bst uh, facilities as well as parking for public as well as public utilities as well as some retail components maybe some commercial components and if the park in the parcels were large enough maybe 20 acres and more we could probably look at staff quarters etc sure. so this is a pictureization of how we visualize this and and we've been pushing this also with the administration hopefully this will also see some light of day at some point one of our exciting projects is <laughs> <a> three <laughs> uh, it's about generating space on the mumbai suburban railway corridor okay and three bawa really the railway corridor is really an overbridge that goes on these these wing structures that you have which is your shelters yeah. what we talked about is maybe we can build below the line we can build beyond the line as in adjacent to the station but on or towards the north and south ends we could talk about between stations between railway stations we could talk about alongside railway stations and this is what we have done at zuinagar nerul sanpada etc we talk about building within the railway station in terms of how do you refresh how do you refurbish how do you renew how do you get a brand new look to railway stations because now they're serving a huge mass of probably 7 and a half million people that travel on it on a daily basis yes and then of course we talked about above which is the last a and when we talk about above what we've already done is kharghar yes. which talks about the entire deck what we could do now is look at commercial space at the first level above and then beyond that we could talk about the car park so <laughs> wow that was great to see uh, bawa <laughs> evolve a new concept of tree bawa and at least you'll remember this if it happens if ever it happens yeah so rather tell us uh, something about your exhibition design projects and mm -hmm. of course i remember uh, the kind of works you've done uh, over more than more than 3 to 400 exhibitions you've done uh, how did the sidco exhibition center happen and along with that the mega auditorium project which you evolved uh, it's truly a masterpiece and uh, you'd like to hear more about such projects uh, please so wasn't really the first exhibition we did uh, we've been working in pragati maidan we've been attending exhibitions ever since i can remember from the early 80s and we've done a couple of hundred of them uh this is this is really the one of the largest exhibition centers that would have been of the world if it was ever constructed uh this was in gift city in uh near amdavad but unfortunately it didn't really happen 
Okay. Uh, this is this is a fabulous exoskeleton commercial building that was designed by our partners Mike Schleich and uh, Schleich Bergman and Partners in Berlin. It was a fabulous building that we were all looking towards seeing happen. Uh, then we of course looked at different formalities, had fun doing stuff. There was new software that was available. We looked at all sorts of strange things, strange forms, and then we were given this opportunity to do the Surat Exhibition Center, which probably had the largest span of a steel structure uh, besides an airport hangar. After which, of course, we were appointed with the uh, Sitco Exhibition Center. Uh, Sitco was very exciting because I've been working for Sitco already since the early 80s, and I thought we should do a fabulous sort of uh, iconic structure for them. And also do some experimentation, which it became it became a sort of jewel in the crown as far as uh, Sitco was concerned. So we used some three thousand odd tons of steel that came in exported from imported from all wow. over the world. We kept our column diameters sure. as forty four hundred uh, millimeters, and we changed the wall thicknesses of those columns depending on the loading conditions. Shirish Patel Associates, Badri was the structural engineer that worked with this. It was quite spectacular. We used all sorts of new software, Tecla. We had some four and a half thousand drawings when we did this finally. A normal project of this size would probably be about 400 odd drawings. Yeah. And we detailed every single thing, and Sitco really became what exactly what we wanted to do. It was quite fascinating. It was excellent working with them. And we created this incredible structure. Probably fifteen one lakh and fifty thousand square feet, resting on just these eight chevron columns. Uh, air conditioning was in the ground. Uh, it was isothermal environments that we were looking at. Lighting was all natural light, and it was a green certified building. Uh, we had some fun even doing the drawings because it was quite spectacular. The youngsters that were working on this were probably fresh off the boat. And it was extremely exciting to see and work with young minds and young technologies and young theories with the old-fashioned, good old, mature stalwarts that made this happen on the site. Wonderful. This was the auditorium building, the convention center. Of course, you could use it as marriage halls as well. And uh, one of the features here was the, the fisheye girder that you see right up there on the right-hand side corner. Yes. And on the extreme left-hand bottom of the frame, you see what we thought was quite a feature, because we hung the entire steel wall mm -hmm. by props and structural grids, so that we did not have any structural members interrupting our glass facade at the bottom. So when people walked continually from one place to another, they could see a completely uninterrupted space outside. So this was exciting. This was the auditorium, 675 seats. Even here, we didn't leave it to chance. We sort of did a graphic design on the seating so that even when you were practicing or rehearsing on stage, at least the guys on stage will enjoy the auditorium. <laughs> we also did the Tripura Exhibition Center. This is a render of this. Uh, what actually happened was this. So it's very, very close to what we had visualized. Tripura, Agartala and Tripura state was the back of beyond. We had to import even our sand and our bricks because there was no building materials over there. But we created quite a spectacular structure in an environment of a lake and a large exhibition ground and stuff. So we had a great time doing this. This was a sustainability project again. We were looking at the waterways, we were looking at public coming here and spending their afternoons, evenings, weekends. Tripura, this is an inside view and little did we realize that we were actually seeding an isolation ward for a COVID hospital. <laughs> yes. Uh, and this is, yes. this is quite exciting because all our Very exhibition large. centers, all our exhibition spaces, all our large scale spaces that we've been designing have been converted to, to, to isolation centers for this COVID space. In fact, yeah. even the Sitco exhibition center, a plan of which you see, has been converted yeah. into an isolation space uh, much earlier this year. Yeah. So that's really Sitco and what we've been doing with the exhibition spaces. Beautiful. So, Ratan, you have uh, deep dive into uh, multiple projects which were very close to the heart for Mumbai City, uh, like the Bandra Valley ceiling, uh, the marine drive development, uh, even your tunnel proposal, 
Uh, tell us about your thoughts uh, behind the proposals and the ideas for the city which you had initially started off with and uh, what do you feel uh, these ideas could have helped the city as such. So the Banana Worley ceiling was one of our large public projects. It took us 11 years. We got it inaugurated by five chief ministers and eventually when it was inaugurated to open it, uh, we weren't even invited for the show. So besides, besides really the bridge which was done by Dar Consultants and Hindustan Construction, uh, yeah. all the other peripheral stuff, all the architecture, all the landscape areas were done by us. And it was quite exciting because every time we talked about something like this, we would look at a, a lane for public transportation because that's the most important thing and that's the most important carrier of people from place to place. Yes. The other thing that we talk about is the large public spaces that we could create as fringes around the large infrastructure project. So this is the overall uh, sort of walkway that we had. And on the other side of the road, which is still today being used as a casting yard, sadly, unfortunately, were really large grounds where we would expect people to come and enjoy the seascape and the landscape on weekends and, and, and holidays. Uh, Marine Drive was very exciting. It was a competition that we won, an international competition. It took us a long time to get focused and getting on this. But really the important thing besides seeing the typical architect and contractor relationship is seeing how citizens and the private sector and the government really engaged on creating a masterpiece for a, a, for a landmark in the city of Bombay. And I think this was very important because what we started looking at was the need for this project. We looked at the logic and the studies, then we looked at the impact of infrastructure. The Bandra Worley ceiling was supposed to come from Worley to Nariman Point by that time and it completely changed how we look at Marine Drive. The environmental structures, the ecological concerns, and then the tip of the iceberg really, that little orange triangle on top is really all about design. So the entire stuff under the design space is really about formulating the ideas and methodologies, how to look at a project like this and the responsibility of carrying a project like this. Wow. Marine Drive had to be versatile enough to handle 50, 100 school buses, the IPL match, people coming in and out of the space. It had to take the torment of the monsoons every single season. Yeah, the trees were getting bashed around. It had huge amounts of utilities under it. Yeah, everybody would dig up the place. There were 30, 31 utilities, if I remember correctly, under this footpath. Wow. Uh, the BEST power lines, gas lines, IT lines, uh, service lines, Tata power, etc., etc. Everybody would just dig up Marine Drive when they felt like doing it. So we created this whole masterpiece space of nothingness. That was our concept. We create, we designed it in plan, but we detailed it very, very carefully. Yeah. You can see the paving design. It's a completely yeah. different design. There are spaces in the design at every 25 meters. It gives you an indicator. We have markers on the ground. We have beautifully designed seating, very, very ergonomically structured. We removed all the trees. We had big fights about that, but that's a separate story. And we were able to deliver on the promise of what we had talked about visualizing. So this is really how Marine Drive happened. Uh, sometimes I get some calls and the people say, hey, listen, we think of you all the time. Thank you very much for Marine Drive. And that's really what makes us feel really, yeah. really bad that we've taken up large city projects like this. Yeah. The detailing on the projects is no compromise whatsoever. There's a paving design. There's a design paved pattern uh, of a wave in this pattern flooring. Uh, the seating is in solid granite, handcrafted to be ergonomically structured, etc. And of course, if you're wondering how the water doesn't collect there, it's been fashioned beautifully in solid granite to see that the water drains out extremely efficiently whenever it collects. The bus stops, I don't think anybody's realized, are made out of surgical steel so that they would not rust. And the undersides of the bus stops are really painted bright red to signify and give ownership to the BEST. 
building level etc you asked me about my tunnel proposal yes that's another one that's another one that's been going on since the early 2000s ever since we started working on the bandra wadi ceiling yeah and we've always proposed that you know from point a to point b that's the second phase from worli to nariman point simple straight line 9.0 kilometers as yeah. against the elevated road which is probably 13 and a half kilometers and a road at ground level which is today our coastal road proposal which yes. is still 12 and a half kilometers and if we did this tunnel proposal with its ends and coming out of marine drive and coming on to uh, uh, your senapati bapat mark etc we'd still save approximately 68000 kilometers of travel car travel wow. per day and yes. that's at today's numbers and that's the amount of fuel you could look at but unfortunately it was an idea too soon nobody knew about tunnels nobody knew about tunnel boring machines and i was ridiculed and still we still foot fighting to see that this happens at some point or the other I'm sure it was. so really when the metro came in and we saw how the metro would interact with the tunnel alignment yeah. this is really how we had proposed it in terms of multi tube tunnels dedicated tunnels metro tunnels separately bus tunnel tunnels separately and of course all the utilities happening in all the cavities that perform and shortest distance to carry everything through and through i've got my fingers and toes crossed that this will happen sometime in our lifetime somewhere and one of the interesting projects that maybe not too many people know about was the signature bridge in delhi in wow. the area of hyderabad linking northeast delhi to the city of delhi and we had an incredible time doing this this was done with uh, subarao and slice bergman and partners and us as a consortium uh, we built it for the delhi tourism travel corporation transport corporation and this was a 300 meter cantilever cable state bridge and it's quite exciting it was completely manufactured in china it weighed some 17000 tons it was completely constructed it took us 15 years to do it just opened last year <laughs> and having said that we got this little uh, you know lookout point on top at the entire in extreme top of the space Oh, uh, just okay. to give you a sense of scale, the Kutub Minar is this height. The Almost bridge, twice. bridge pipe is this height. Yes. So it's really quite exciting. Uh, the overall concept of this was to do a large signature master plan for the public of Delhi to come and use the water bodies there. But the signature bridge sort of got away with it. Uh, what you can see, the peacock feather painted on the pylon. Yeah. This is the first hand painted bridge in the world. and wow. it's quite spectacular because it was done part by part and painted and constructed as it was going uh, the waters have cleaned up around the yamuna and i'm hoping that we can get our uh, master plan going as well so these are all these institutional things that we've been doing we've been looking at initiatives some of them are project some of them are initiatives from our urban space from uh, our best wishes that uh, most of these projects uh, see the, the light of the tunnel and uh, Hats off to you, Ratan, for cracking such wonderful projects for the city, for the country. Thank you. Uh, personally, uh, I wanted to get uh, a small favor, or rather, on behalf of the entire audience, uh, we need a guru mantra from you as to how you could manage uh, these government officials to handle such kind of bold and uh, unique projects in terms of the budgets, in terms of The, the items in the DSRs, or uh, be it the, the kind of revolutionary shapes and uh, the, the gigantic size for the projects. Just a small piece of advice to all of us. So when I started doing these public projects, I think I started losing my hair, and then I lose the color of my hair, etc., etc. But that's really what it's all about. 
Uh, public projects are not very different from private projects. Okay, the only problem is that in a public project, you don't have one client that you're talking to. You're talking to the good of the public, or you're talking to the good of the government or the or the bureaucracy as you need. If you are able to align political will, the people's will, and the administrators' will, I think the public project will go through very smoothly. I'm sure. We've never had a problem dealing with the public, except uh, with public projects or the government authorities, except for the multitude of numbers of times you have to start from scratch because the person at the top has changed, yeah, priorities sure. yeah. have changed, budgets have changed, and things like that. But I think it's about people management, and it's more about expectation management than just managing the people. Yeah? Yeah. And when I say managing, I'm not looking at managing the way architects <laughs> get managed. Okay. No, it's no, really, we understand. We it's understand. Really, it's really looking at the needs, being able to hear, listen, understand what it's all about, and try and deliver it. And it and it's not the same every time you think you know the answer. The question has changed. Yes. So I think it's about it's about really looking at government as a simple client, but taking the entire responsibility on self on yourself to deliver. They don't know much about what you are asking or the technologies. Or they may know much, much more than you do, which is normally the case. And I've I've come across the most intelligent people in the government, and and we're talking about the bureaucracy, the government, political bodies, citizens' bodies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think it's great fun to to work on government projects, and I think all architects should start focusing on putting some time and energy into looking at infrastructure, putting in the aesthetics. Otherwise, our government projects are aesthetically bankrupt. I, I fully agree with you. So that's where I'd stop on that. No, uh, thanks, thanks, and that's a, a very valuable piece of advice. Rather, I have personally grown up doing a lot of data centers, uh, data recovery centers in and around uh, in India and Singapore. Uh, I have a very fond question, which has always been in my mind, and I wanted to always check with you. Uh, how did you manage to do? Uh, the data centers and the data recovery centers, and I'm especially talking about the Reliance NOC, uh, because data centers are more of technology uh, and less of architecture. And uh, what was your uh, precursor to such kind of a project which uh, you have evolved? And I would compare it to a NASA uh, experience center as well. And personally, how did you manage to take Reliance as a client uh, by the horns? And that's that's a very uh, important question for us to learn as well. And one last one in this uh, segment is, what's your personal take? And I need an honest answer. What's your personal take on smart cities in India? Rather okay, so so I'm I'm going to go through the deck like we normally do. Yeah. So. Data centers, tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four. I mean, we've been doing them for a long time. Uh, operation centers, command centers, we've also been doing for a long time. I think what you're talking about is this Reliance NOC, yes. which we did probably 20 years ago. Yes. And when we started this NOC, we were sort of picked up by a Reliance team after we'd done some fabulous showcase work for the Tata Group. And they said, would you like to come in and help us do our NOC? And I said, yeah, great. And they said, you'd be the local architect. And I said, Love, nothing like it. We'd learn a lot. We said, we'd like, like to go around the world and try and figure out what it's all about because this yeah. is the first time we're doing it. But Reliance by this time had already started laying out 65,000 kilometers of OFCs, fiber optic cables, all around the country. And they all this had to terminate in this media convergence node and the Knox Center. The reason why I'm able to show these photographs to you is because they've been on the net and they've been of in course. the public domain for a long time. Otherwise, you would never have been able to see this. Yes. So we designed this as a visitor experience. In principle, the visitors walk on this bridge, which is about it. The bridge is hung from the ceiling by these wow. little columns that you see, six inch diameter columns. And this visitor bridge takes people across diagonally of the center, looking down into the space where people are working. This center controlled the entire network operations of the country at the time. So really, it's about an exhibition that happens before and after. It's about a visitor journey. It's about how they experience it. Your question was, how did we start this? We were waiting for this foreign architect to jump in. Sadly, <laughs> there was no foreign architect. We were told that we had to oh. ask this. 
uh, when we spoke to Mukesh and he introduced this to us, he said he wants this done extremely fast. We said it will take at least 24 months. He said nothing doing, it has to be done in 18 months. We said not possible Mukesh ji, it's not possible. He said 17 months, <laughs> it's very complex. It's He said 16 months and I think we got the hang of it. Yeah. Mukesh meant business. He had the most incredible team working with us. Yes. We were working with that team, technologists from all over the space and he said you can ask for whatever you want from wherever you want in the world and we will give it to you. It has to be done. Yes. We finally cracked this knock center, including everything, commissioned within less than 10 and a half months. Wow. So that's really that's really the buzz. We had some 80 people in our office actually working on this project at the time. But then we've done a lot of other command centers, other data centers. Uh, your, your question about how do we use and how do we look at smart? I think the most important thing we talked about was specific, measurable, achievable, relevant and time bound is really what smart stands for. Yes. And it's quite frankly, management jargon. Yeah. Having said that, we look at how the hell do we look at an acronym like smart relevant to architecture, relevant to urban design, relevant to our cities. And we decided that we should go one up and say smarter yeah. and look at experiences, experiential efficiencies, emergent technologies, look at equitable spaces for everyone, look at resilience, look at reclaimable spaces, look at regenerative. So in principle, this is our compact version of what it was about smart cities. Yeah. Uh, we were also very, very lucky, uh, Parish because we were appointed by the government to write a technical report on the designing oh. and planning of smart cities using IoT and ICT because of our, our expertise in the technology spaces. We yeah. got a team together and we cracked this out over the, about two years of video conferencing. We never saw a single co-author or co-author or collaborator on this ever face to face. We did everything on this video conferencing etc and this was like two years ago so this is really where we were on the smart uh, space uh, to your question about how far we are from using smart using technology i think it's going to come in really rapidly uh, technology is going to come in and take over our cities we know that as long as we can be not slaves to the technology but we can use them as tools to enhance what we want to do i think that's going to be fine well, that was uh, really fabulous and uh, I actually was really hoping that there are some real brains uh, behind the smart cities and the smart uh, initiatives uh, by a lot of senior people in the government and uh, glad that you spent uh, at least these many hours and these many years uh, on evolving this. But then I seen all what you've done uh, till till this point and uh, here's a simple question in fact we all were discussing this very loudly what if rgb were the chief infrastructure officer of india <laughs> and i'm talking a very serious question and I, this is a very valid post or a designation for you uh, what would be your initiatives for the mumbai city uh, with respect to the density the transportation how would these impact the masses, the economies, mm -hmm. the livelihood and the nationalism? And uh, I think uh, you should run for this post and we all will stand by with you. But I'd like to hear more about this from you. Please. So <laughs> I stopped running, Parish. And uh, well, if you're asking me seriously, this is a this is a topic for another webinar with 500 speakers telling us what to do and how to do it. Yeah. But if you looked at it in a, in a two-line answer, what I would suggest is that we don't start looking at the government to change our lives. I think we should look at baby steps. I think things can happen as architectural groups, as user groups, as citizens groups, and we can push towards having this done. I think the government is very open. Uh, the, the bureaucracy is very open to new ideas and new technologies. And they're rapidly moving towards getting this thing done uh, in, in the city of Bombay. But I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, the important thing is also to look at initiatives from different societies, from different people, from different climates, et cetera, et cetera. 
we are looking at education social issues we are looking at sanitation i mean in the good old days we had years ago when we used to attend these ubri conferences when i was a kid we had all the great architects sitting there and saying bombay is not going to survive more than 5 years the way it's growing yeah and that was 45 years ago so we are doing pretty well and i think with the advent of all these new uh, transportation modes the metro the mon monorail etc coming in i think bombay has some some chances of survival for sure i'm sure i'm looking forward uh, rather coming on to multidisciplinary practice uh, how did the early days of such kind of a practice help you uh, to nurture your values uh, it would be incomplete also to not to talk about your uh, retail and interior experience all your design bugs uh, in in this audience are dying to know about your uh, retail and interior experience as well uh, over to you if you looked at an architect an architecture and architectural practice has to have a huge amount of backup and multidisciplinary space yeah you cannot just have a single competency and go forward and when we talk about multidisciplinary is really challenging the conventional approach yeah. challenging it by saying it has to be otherwise multitask approach chucking out the straight t square and looking at non condition lateral thought process and cross cross platform so in principle you could talk about anybody in the design space becoming a collaborator anybody complimenting you or supplementing you with your services uh, changing stuff so effectively i would as an architect think in black and white and my graphic design team would think in color and add that i would yeah. think black and white in a large scale and my furniture team would come in and populate that the lighting team the design team etc etc so it's really how we work together and created this organizational strategy of a multidisciplinary practice but when we talk multidisciplinary i'm just going to run through very quickly some slides uh, parish because otherwise this is this is never ending yeah i i used to do sets and stage design this is a yes. piece of chewing gum uh, we did da dance we did lighting we did theater uh, set design production design we did a great stuff in terms of just having fun doing very very clear furniture uh rock and roll showcases we had great fun doing this in the office when coca cola came to india we suggested this as a graphic for them of course they went with an ad ad agency in a very conventional sort of way uh we did the communication design for orange and and the telecom companies when they came down we did experience centers uh for large clients we in fact designed the third three dimensional logo for the tata group when wolf allens was doing the two dimensional logo and we did all the branding and stuff for the tata group as a conglomerate if you talk about retail we probably done close to 1000 plus retail outlets for all wow. the reasonably recognizable brands uh starting early 80s and going till probably very very recently uh, i'm not going to go into detail on that but effectively there's huge amounts of stuff that we've been able to do uh when you talk about interiors i'm not even going into details on interiors but yes the architecture and the urban design has had a fair share in fact an equivalent share of interior experience retail experience branding experience that has taken us through all this way till today sure. really we're talking about 40 years of my life and the multidisciplinary practice being impacting five verticals that we wanted to work within okay and and I'll, i'll i'll go through that as we go forward uh pratham thanks for that and due to paucity of time uh tell us about your practice with various collaborations which you've been doing internationally as well as with domestic collaborations uh how did you choose your partners and was it only on need basis or whether uh it was some specific criteria to get into such collaborations does the profit sharing here work and is there always a happy ending this is a very important point for all of us to learn that and you've seen the most of these so the first sort of collaborative effort is when we split up the company into five verticals uh, when i turned 50 i was looking at a succession plan and this is really the exercise on collaboration so from architecture to communications to sustainability to project and production management and to even it 
at that time we started it company thinking that you know if we're not making money on architecture and urban design let's at least get into it because everybody seems to be making money there but even that's a dream for us but it's really restructuring ourselves to reinforce what we built up over the past 35 30 years by that time mm-hmm. our collaborations are all sorts of collaborations there are some supplementary collaborations people who supplement the sort of services that we do and even complementary collaborations like mbrdb or even hafiz uh, national national collaborations uh, we work with all sorts of engineering teams we work with other architects we've created our own companies with other architects to do works uh, of a large scale so really it's about collaboration where you looked at a client and an architect to start with and then you had the contractors who jumped in and then you had the project managers who jumped into the situation <laughs> all over the place yeah. yeah then we look at private government community all this is really the left hand side that's feeding us our projects yes and when you start looking at what we need to survive we're talking about the classic structure mepf soil mechanics these are your specialists yes when we look at the super specialists which is one ring around that which is vastu and facade and acoustics and lead etc you also have the super super specialists that come in and the ekdam super specialists that come in now when you talk about these kind of guys yeah. all collaborating and trying to figure out what you're doing and how you're doing i think we need to figure out exactly who's going to pay who i don't think you should look at the money's coming in and if everybody is going to be respected and paid off and make some profit yeah we are not sure i mean all our collaborations are in various stages some have ended happily some have ended sadly some are continuing and most of them are continuing it's about relationships that you build working yes. with people yes the most important thing is leave your ego at home and when you're working on a project leave the camera at home okay it's very important to do the project for the sake of doing the project as a project centric situation knowing exactly who your user is going to be and what you're doing this for it's not about how you will mark the city or how you'll mark the land with your project a lot of us have always wonder what kind of metal uh, you are with the kind of vigor and the kind of vitality you have uh, ever shown and may god uh, give you a wonderful and a fabulous life ahead rahul all our best wishes to you but what are your thoughts for the future <laughs> so we might jump straight into that I think all of us need to repurpose ourselves. We are, we are very clear. We don't know what's happening tomorrow. We don't know what's going to happen three months from now. Yeah. Uh, this has been a mess. As in, this is a WhatsApp that's been going across. January, February were the two sane months of an already bad economic year for all of us, and yeah. suddenly March throws us into a complete khichdi. I don't know whether we will continue as architects because our clients don't know what the worth is to them. Uh, I don't know whether we'll be able to survive economically. I'm not sure whether I should go in and continue to work my entire life now in these charities that I'm very, very involved in and have been for the past 30, 40 years of my life, very, very intimately. I'm not sure whether I should continue to go to different gods and whether I should kneel in front of my accounts department saying, "Hey, hey, man, show me the way." <laughs> we're not sure. We're not sure who our gods are going to be, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm going to end on a very very simple story where we talk about context we talk about the complexity of our projects and we talk about the competency that we need the competence levels that you need to be able to service the complex projects that we have yes and we're looking at efficiencies and effectiveness the efficiencies everybody has been talking about i think we should look at how architects can be more effective in our lives the tools that we have for our architecture practice there are new tools that are happening for urban design for architecture there are all sorts of new technologies that are accessible to us which can do all sorts of magic measure maximize model motivate monetize mitigate merge manage maintain right yeah we've talked about new technologies that are going to really impact how demographics work with us how crowdsourcing user response how the behavioral shift is going to happen i think what is crop, crop, uh, cropping up very clearly is really new collaborations that we're going to look in and brand new impact that we look at 
I think this is where life is going to be. It's not about working with new architects or new designers. It's about working with different sectors of society, different sections, different pro uh, professionals, and yeah. coming up with a new impact. Eventually, it's just going to be a question of balance. Where trust, credibility, the ethical structures, fair practice, and eventually user benefit is going to really harness and look at the way we look at our lives uh, here onwards. I think, like I said, it's all just a question of balance. Dutton, we have absolutely mesmerized with the words and your thoughts. Thank uh, you. Indeed, indeed, it was a great pleasure to learn so much on your design approach and. Uh, most critically about being uh, the excellent human being that you are. With special thanks to uh, Banu, Rihan, Ria, and all the family. Uh, of course, uh, Ajay, Shireen, Ashe, uh, and Roran from Team RJB, uh, Rupali, Ayush, Dhyan, and significantly Dhawal, Siddharth, Karishma, Devanshi, Neetu from Team IDAC. Thank you so much for all the support. Thanks, uh, Ratan, again for a wonderful evening today, and we wish you all the best for your future. And I'd like to say, I'd like to say a quick thank you, Parish, before you sign off. Is sure. a big thank you to Aja and a big thank you to IDAC for allowing these things yeah. to happen and, and influencing the community for us. That's that's very kind of you. Thank you. And a big thanks to all the viewers. Uh, for joining us to celebrate RJB today with Aja. Stay blessed and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, architect Radhan Batli Boy, for walking us down your path of success and the colossal knowledge shared this evening. It is an absolute honor to hear it of it firsthand from you. Thank you, Pari architect Parish Tapsi, for bringing out the best of it. A special thanks to our sponsor, Everest Industry, and a big thank you to all our audience that have shown support and tuned this, this evening. Until we meet again, stay safe and gear up for the new normal.